Coming up on DTNS, how to keep your phone screen virus-free, Oppo's hot new phone and watch, and there is an afterlife for gadgets, and Nicole Lee has been there. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, March 6, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We are joined today by Nicole Lee, Senior Editor at Engadget.com. Welcome back, Nicole. Hello. Happy to be back. We were just talking about uh, home remedies for getting gum out of your hair. We were talking about uh, dog etiquette. All kinds of good stuff at Good Day Internet. Become a member and get the wider show at Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and Twitter have all confirmed that they plan to pay their hourly workers regular wages, whether their services can be used or not. The companies have encouraged people to work from home, but many hourly workers do jobs like drive shuttles or housekeeping the office or being part of the kitchen staff, and those cannot be done remotely. Samsung says it will temporarily move some of its smartphone production from South Korea to Vietnam after another of its Korean staff tested positive for the coronavirus at its Gumi factory, which is close to the city of Daegu. Since last month, a total of six workers have tested positive at the factory. Samsung does say that operations will resume at the Gumi factory on Saturday. It sounds like they're trying to do a, a big clean sweep. It's mm. not, not a very long time to be down. Short form video streaming service Quibi is giving people a 90 day free trial if they sign up for the service before launch day, which is on April 6th. The service will cost $4.99 per month with ads and $7.99 with, without after the trial. Four independent iPhone developers told CNBC that Apple rejected their apps related to the COVID-19 virus outbreak because they aren't recognized institutions like governments or hospitals. One developer claimed an Apple employee told them over the phone that anything related to the virus must be released by an official health organization or government. A source told CNBC that Apple is evaluating the apps related to the coronavirus to prevent the spread of misinformation. So they're cracking down a little harder than they might otherwise, it sounds like. All right, let's talk about something that isn't a virus, an Oppo phone. It is indeed not a virus. Oppo announced its Find X2 Pro smartphone featuring a 120 hertz, 6.7 inch quad HD plus AMOLED display, Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 chipset, 12 gigs of LP DDR5 RAM, 512 gigabytes of storage, and in-display fingerprint reader. The Find X2 drops the pop-up camera from the original Find X, but offers a three-sensor system on the back with a 48-megapixel main shooter using Sony's new IMX689 sensor that supports phase-detect autofocus and 12-bit raw capture, a 5X optical zoom telephoto, and a 48-megapixel ultra-wide camera. These are nice cameras. The phone also supports 65 watt super VOOC 2.0 flash charging, providing a full charge of the 4260 milliamp battery in just 38 minutes. The phone comes in black ceramic or orange vegan leather with a rose gold frame and starts at 6,999 won or about 1,199 euros available in Europe this May. Yeah, so they took took out the uh, the the fun little pop up camera, uh, but they replaced it with a really crazy good set of of, uh, of cameras here and and, and sensors, uh, and and for a pretty reasonable price. I mean, you're talking about a few hundred dollars here for for a great phone. Uh, it's gonna come to Mexico, it looks like. Uh, we don't have a date on that, but that's the indication. So it'll get close to the United States, uh, and Oppo is just kind of slowly rolling out around the world, really focus on Western Europe right now. Nicole, what do you think of this phone? I mean, it's really impressive. And, um, you know, the Chinese makers have always been kind of at the forefront of that because um, they kind of not say copycat, but they think, I guess they're inspired by their competition elsewhere uh, to make these phones. And uh, I will, I mean, the Oppo pop-up thing was kind of cute, but I don't know. I always thought it was a little touch on the gimmicky side, but this seems like an actual, like really sleek, look, nice looking phone. Yeah, I, I I agree that if you're going to replace that pop up camera uh, with something better, like <laughs> you know, the, then I don't think too many people will complain. They also Oppo itself said they wanted to make it IP68 dust proof and waterproof, uh, and they couldn't do that with the pop up camera. Mm -hmm. So that's another le legitimate reason there as well. That this is a this is a nice little phone. Let's talk about their watch. Oppo also announced 
the Oppo Watch, as you might have <laughs> guessed it would be called. Uh, it's a 46 millimeter and 41 millimeter uh, version of a watch. The 46 millimeter version features a 1.91 inch OLED screen with 402 by 473 resolution, uh, fitness and sleep tracking, music playback, heart rate monitoring. It doesn't have EKG stuff, but it does have heart rate monitoring. Water resistant up to 50 meters, includes NFC, eSIM, cellular connectivity, claimed 40 hour battery life on the 46 millimeter watch. Uh, can achieve a 46% charge in 15 minutes with the VOOC fast charging system. It runs a version of Android called ColorOS Watch. It does not appear to be based on Android Wear, it's a, it's, which is an interesting choice. Uh, mm-hmm. Launched in China for 1,499 yuan. That's about $215. Also, uh, the 41 millimeter version uh, has a 1.6 inch screen with 24 hour battery life. That one is uh, a little bit cheaper. I think this, this number I've got in here may be incorrect. Uh, but a premium stainless steel 46 millimeter version costs $2,000. 1,499 yuan. All three models go up for pre-order March 23rd, shipping March 24th. Well, I, I, the, the, the sort of buzz around this was like, wow, this looks great. And it also looks a lot like an Apple Watch. Um, like, you know, like not even, one, it's, a, it's a lot like the Apple Watch. Right. And, you know, uh, the EKG stuff aside, it, it does seem like that's, you know, they're going for something that's pretty comparable. Yeah. Uh, the prices are 1,999 yuan for the 46 millimeter and 1,499 for the 41 millimeter. That stainless steel mm-hmm. one's still much more expensive, 24.99. Uh, but yeah, for something that looks like an Apple Watch, that's a good price. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I think that's kind of like my overarching question about these like non Apple watches, non Apple Watch watches, and um, I. Does it does it really behoove them to look exactly like the Apple Watch? It like, wouldn't like if you were if you were a, a, a consumer who didn't want it who didn't want an Apple Watch, you wanted something different. Like would this? I don't know. It's, it's I just wonder. I'm just wondering. Like, is this supposed to be an? Is this supposedly like very deliberately? Yeah, yeah. An Apple Watch clone, or if you're an Android person, like, do you want something that looks exactly like an Apple Watch? I mean, I don't know. I yeah, think it's just it's it's kind of like early days of the form factor, you know. Like once the yeah. iPhone arrived in the world, well, a lot of Android phones looked a lot like the iPhone at first. You know, now we have so many that you know everyone's trying to do you know pop up cameras and be different. You know, which is I think speaking to your point, Nicole. But I think Oppo was sort of like, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, even my my Versa too. I mean, no one's gonna think this is an Apple Watch, but they all have the pretty much same form factor at least right now. Yeah, the negative side is this is just a knockoff without originality. The middle yeah. range is to say, well, if you don't want to live in the Apple ecosystem, but you like that style, here's an option for you. And I guess the overly positive one uh, would be this is just the convergence of a of a good design. And, and that happens a lot where people start making things that look alike because that's the design that works the best. It also really speaks, I think, to like the uh, the fact that Android Wear is falling out of favor, uh, because you know this is a, this is a really nice looking watch, right? It's an Android watch, but it doesn't use Android Wear. What does that say about Android Wear? What does that say about yeah? You know where that's going? It doesn't seem like a good sign. So it's it's harder to use Android on a watch without Android Wear theoretically. So yeah, right. not 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 a great look for Android Wear that Oppo didn't choose it. The New York Times reports that Clearview AI facial recognition database marketed to law enforcement was also beta tested by people not in law enforcement for personal reasons, such as finding out who was dating their children. That is actually an anecdote that the New York Times added in the story. Clearview co-founder Juan Ton Thought said that the trial accounts were offered to potential and current investors and other strategic partners. Yeah, they, this happened before the launch of Clearview AI. It doesn't. It's not clear to me that all those accounts have been ended, though. Uh, and again, Clearview AI doesn't freak me out as much as it seems to freak out other people because it's taking public images and helping you figure out who those people might likely be. Well, uh, it's, a, yeah. it's, it's a tool and and tools can be used for ill or, or good. Uh, I totally get where Clearview AI trying to drum up money would let potential and current investors uh, and strategic partners like, hey, you wanna partner with us on this? Here, we'll let you try it out. That's totally normal for most products is to let your investors try them out. It gets a little weird when you're talking about a product with this much controversy around it. 
Yeah, I mean, I think for for all that the flack that Clearview AI gets, you know, there there is an example of, you know, somebody dating the children is like, what? What happened? What happened was somebody saw his daughter at the same restaurant, but, in you know, who was with somebody that he didn't know. But in order to use Clearview AI, he had a waiter go take a clandestine photo of the that's couple. That's where it gets weirdest, right? <laughs> right. That's so where it's like, gets... I mean, that's bad behavior on on a user's part. It doesn't really say anything about the software itself. Yeah, because you could do other kinds of reverse image searches uh, to, exactly. to try to figure it out. So yeah, uh, I, I guess that's my point. Is Clearview AI uh, just needs some safeguards not to be used by creepy people? Uh, <laughs> Right. And, and yes. whether they're in law enforcement or not, uh, creepy uses, creepy people, abuses, you know, that, that's all. That's the thing with facial recognition. It's so new that we, we're not comfortable with the rules about how it should and should not be used. Well, it's kind of like, you know, someone saying, well, you shouldn't stalk people on Facebook. That's just not ethical, you know, but. Well, there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of tools that you can use for reasons that other people would find unsavory, but they exist. Yeah. And and could be used for, for not unsavory. Exactly. Purposes. That too. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, there's a lot of attention on hygiene these days uh, with COVID-19 out there. And smartphones are getting a lot of that attention because if you wash your hands and you don't touch your face, but your phone's full of bacteria and viruses, and then you touch that, uh, that is a vector for transmission. You should clean your phone once a week or so. You don't have to clean it all the time, but uh, this is the consensus health recommendations out there once a week or so, or after you travel, or after you let someone who's not you use your phone, uh, you should use simple soap and water and a microfiber cloth. More powerful disinfectants can and will damage the phone. So turn your phone off, remove the case, make sure nothing is plugged in, begin by just wiping the phone with the cloth without any water or soap, and then, uh, if needed, a low amount of warm water can be used. You don't want to sop it, but just first, just try cleaning it and see if it if it gets pretty clean. If you're like, nope, that's not good enough for me. I want to make sure I get it super clean. You can use a little warm water and regular soap. That is probably enough. You don't have to overdo it. Uh, don't let any water get into any open ports. Some phones may let you dip them in clean water uh, for cleaning. Uh, you may be able to use an alcoholic solution or something stronger on it, but don't attempt that unless you are confirmed from the maker of the phone, not just some guy on a message board, but like from the phone maker's support website that that's okay. Because some of these coatings will come off if, even if you're using a low amount of alcohol. Uh, an ultraviolet light sanitizer will kill some, but not all germs. But again, most health organizations say really just wiping it down, maybe using a little warm soap and water, uh, is going to get your phone clean. For keyboards and laptops, different methods apply, including compressed air. You don't want to use compressed air on the phone, they say, but you you know, you know do want to use it on your keyboard. You can use a little bit of alcohol there. A lot of monitors, you can use a little bit of an alcohol solution. Same thing you might clean your glasses with. Uh, uh, but you want to... You want to not overdo it. The temptation is like, oh, I'm going to get this thing clean. I'm going to dump it in alcohol. That's a bad idea. Uh, don't do that. So I've got a microfiber cloth. If you've been watching the video version of this, you've seen me cleaning. Uh, I've got a terry cloth. Not ideal because it's got some fibers and stuff that can get loose, but it's better than nothing. Uh, Sarah, Nicole, are you guys cleaning your phones too? Well, I... I, I realize that I should be cleaning my phone more, but this discussion got me thinking. My phone is, again, for the video folks, my phone is incredibly cracked, um, mostly on the back, although I've got some cracks on the front. This is just sort of the way I live my life. But I was thinking, you know, this is actually an interesting bacteria thought, because even if I clean my phone as it should be cleaned, well, first of all, I have to be a little bit more careful because the phone is already more fragile, but I wonder how much the cleaning is less effective because I have cracks in the phone that aren't supposed to be there. Does, uh, doesn't mean I'm going to freak out. I'm not right. too much of a germaphobe about this whole thing, but it, it, it did get me thinking about, hmm, yeah, you know, you're walking around with a phone in a state it's not supposed to be in. I wonder how much that affects this. Beatmaster says, what I don't get is what you get out of this. Phones are personal devices. How many times do other people put their hands on it? Doesn't matter. If you touch a surface that has the virus on it, and the virus gets on your fingers, and then you touch your phone, that virus could stay on the phone for up to a week. Uh, so you, if you want to make sure that you're not 
getting anything off of your phone, uh, this is a way to do it. Normally, I would say it's probably not that big of a deal uh, and that, you know, you clean your phone when you think you need to clean your phone. But if you're in a situation where you are extra concerned about picking something up, maybe you're working in an airport or you're a hotel uh, or something like that, this is, this is something you want to take uh, take account of and, and start getting in the habit of, of cleaning that phone regularly. And think of, you know, the last time you were at a restaurant for a birthday party and someone says, will you take a photo of us? That's somebody else touching sure. somebody's phone. Yeah. Happens all and, the time. That, that's why they say if you do let someone else touch your phone, you want to clean it after that because mm -hmm. you don't know who knows where their fingers have been. They do. <laughs> Maybe they don't even know. You know? <laughs> they don't even remember. Uh, well, some, some better news. Sonos removed the recycle mode on older devices that was previously tied to its trade-up program. Existing customers are still eligible for the 30% trade-up discount on new devices, but originally opting in, in the trade-up program would grant customers the discount except give legacy devices only 21 days before entering recycle mode which would erase all data and permanently disable the device. So once you once you once you went up, the old thing was bricked. And now users can choose to keep it or give it to somebody else or recycle it or send it back to Sonos for recycling. So the options are there for the customers who were not super pleased about this program in the first place. Yeah, uh, this this it is tempting to say what took them so long, but uh, at least they got there. Uh, good job, Sonos. Uh, nobody likes the thing they own to be bricked, even if you are giving them a thirty percent trade up discount. Uh, that that just comes off as adding insult to injury at that point. So yep. yeah, I, I they are also committed to continuing to do safety updates uh, for for the old Sonos. They won't be adding features. Uh, it will continue to be a problem <clears throat> if you try to run these on the same network as the newer ones. They're working on a solution for that, but they are going to keep patching them so they won't become security vulnerabilities, and that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Considering they're really expensive devices, and uh, yeah, this is a really good thing. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Now, we just talked about Sonos doing the right thing and not breaking an old device, uh, but Philips is not going to brick, but they are going to limit the functions of the original Hue Bridge. That's the round one. If you have the square one, you don't have to worry. But if you got the old round one, uh, as of April 30th, it will be limited to local use. It'll be shut off from online. So you can use the app to control it when you're in the house on the same network, but that's it. Uh, the circular bridge was introduced in 2012 and replaced by the square one in 2016. So we have two stories here that kind of you know, remind us that gadgets don't live forever. Uh, they do go away, and we've all got drawers probably filled uh, with with some old gadgets and wires and things like that. But Nicole, I love that you looked into the afterlife of these gadgets that have been discontinued by their companies and found some hopeful stories. Right, and I think in almost all of the all of the cases that I've researched, it's it's always sparked by a really beloved gadget that has like hundreds of thousands of fans and the, the passionate sort of passionate really passionate community really and one of them is uh, the pebble you know that's one of the most successful kickstarters of all time uh, just tens of thousands of fans who actually bought the pebble um, years and years of just building up this community of people who just love their pebble and this is despite the fact that the apple watch came out like you know a few years later android wear came out so it kind of survived this like influx of all these you know wearables, except it kind of didn't because, as we all know, Pebble kind of died away. It got bought out by Fitbit in 2016, um, and it, it officially it officially was shut down. The servers were shut down in 2018. So if you don't have servers and don't have apps, your Pebble is kind of useless, right? Um, except. A community, I guess, as I mentioned, that there was a developer community that it really cultivated from the very beginning, and they built up this site called Rebel, Rebel.io, I believe, is the URL for the site. And Rebel spelled R-E-B-B-L-E, -E, like Pebble, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so these people, like when they first heard, okay, Fitbit's buying this company out. Let's pull our resources, and they just like downloaded everything they could—the SDK, the documentation, like everything they could get their hands on. They downloaded everything in like two days, and in two days they had this built this whole new website. And uh, they said they didn't have everything ready just yet, but they were like, "We have everything now. We can just reverse engineer from from here." 
and it took them a couple of years to do so. But right now, if you go to like, if you if you have an old pebble lying around your house somewhere, and uh, you still have that connecting plug and everything, you can actually get it up and running again by going to rebel.io, following really simple instructions. That's a link. That's a link you can click and learn, learn about all the FAQs and stuff. They have. Uh, I was really impressed. Um, they have a, a customer service team. Uh, they have a Discord chat channel that you can go for like help questions. It's a full on organization run by volunteers. And uh, yeah, there there is hope yet for all of you Pebble lovers out there. That is one of the greatest stories uh, of, of a gadget that no one who loved it wanted to see go away. And so they banded together and made sure that it didn't go <laughs> away. I mean, they're not making new Pebbles, but the Pebbles no. that are out there can still work. Uh, I was more surprised, however, because I know how much people who have Pebbles love their Pebble. I was more surprised that the Chumbi still works. That's the <laughs> That was a surprise for me, too. So the Chumbi, I don't know if anyone remembers the Chumbi. It was like a small little, like, what do you, what do you mean? Like a, like, a, like a personal internet device, I guess you could call it. Yeah, it was, it was like a small Echo Show <laughs> that was also a beanbag, basically. It was yeah. like, yeah, it was like kind of squishy. It was like a squishy small little alarm clock almost. Um, it, and it would it show you could you could use it use it to show like your Facebook feed and little weather widgets. Like think of it as a as a widget screen, like a screen full of widgets essentially, rather than I guess a traditional smart display that you would know of today. Um, so it was, you know, it was again founded in 2006, and um, the the founder Bunny Huang he made the hardware, but he the whole idea behind the Chumbi was that the the Chumbi hardware was supposed to be the the seller for the OS. Like the, they want, they really wanted to sell the the operating system to like TVs and PCs and things like that, but. Um, and they even sold they even sold off their their OS to uh, the Sony Dash. I don't know if anyone remembers the Sony Dash, and that was kind of like a fancier, more elegant chumbi, if you will. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that too because because with the i with, you know, with the iPhone and all of these other gadgets coming along, just couldn't really, didn't really stand a chance really um, against all the the, the the oncoming smartphone revolution. But the CTO of Chumbi, uh, Dwayne Maxwell, he was like. No, um, I will keep it running myself. So he essentially bought out Chumbi from the shareholders, like just with his own money. And, you know, he kept it running um, with his own time and by by himself. And if you go to like, I think, Chum I can't remember the, the exact site. I think he, the, the company is called uh, Blue Octi. And there's a comp there's a site you can go to to look at it and you if you have an old chumbi lying around you can still go to this website and you know plug it in everything and it will still work i mean he said that he, he told me that he had to like re-engineer everything because the, the old widget framework used adobe flash like, which nobody uses nowadays <laughs> so, he, so he had to like rework everything like he used to use javascript html5 and all of that so but it's up like it's running and if you have an old chumbi lying around it will still work, and they do have a customer service team, which again, which, which is 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 amazing to me that they have a customer service team, and they have like a little store. And if if your if your chumbi sort of like breaks a little bit, you can actually send it in, and they'll try to fix it. Um, so that's really interesting that this this like small little yeah yeah um, fan community. Well, because you would be forgiven if you heard this and said, so wait a minute, the CTO bought the company and just kept it running. How is that uh, a story of life after death? That's not exactly what Nicole was describing. This was a company in bankruptcy, right? Oh, yeah. It was, it was going out of business. And what the CTO did was, for cents on the dollar, he bought the IP. He didn't IP. buy the company. He just bought the parts that would let him maintain the servers. Mm -hmm. And basically is doing this as a labor of love. This is not a startup that's, you know, doing rounds of Series B funding. This is just <laughs> the CTO trying to make just enough money off of people who want to keep their chumbies running so that he can keep the servers up and keep their chumbies running, right? Right. And the, well, that's the other thing was that, you know, obviously it, it takes money to run this thing by yourself. And he was like, okay, um, if you would just want to use your Chumbi as just like a dumb alarm clock, you know, that's free. That's fine. But if you want to use any of the widgets, uh, that will cost like $3 a month, and which is fine. Yeah, I think it's very, cheap. very yeah. reasonable. Um, so, yeah, that's how, that's kind of how he's keeping it all going. Oh, and yeah. I should say the Rebel website uses Patreon. 
for if to, I do. to support yeah. it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, before we wrap up, I know there's, you, there's a few others out there, including one that, that just got a, another life. There's a, there's a crowdfunding campaign started this week for Nabaz Tag Round 2 or 3, I guess, depending on. Yeah, how right. That, that's a little Wi-Fi bunny, Wi-Fi connected bunny into that. Yeah, that's being crowdfunded. Uh, the little printer that uses the little receipt printer that's being sort of res- that, that was resurrected last year a little bit. Uh, and there are all kinds of small little stuff. I'm sure that I haven't even looked into. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's nice to know that if if there's enough people who love a gadget, uh, that we have the resources for people to kind of rally around and keep it going. So cool. Thanks for looking into this, Nicole. I'm glad you did the story for gadget. <laughs> yeah. Join in the conversation in our Discord. If you haven't already, it's a rockin' good time. And you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out what's in the mailbag. Oh, let's. Uh, We got uh, a a response from Chris Christensen, our amateur traveler's note about remote work yesterday. This person wanted to stay anonymous but said, just wanted to respond as somebody who's been using those sites plus more without any success for over a year. Wouldn't want anybody to think that this is an easy cure-all. Plan on submitting dozens of applications without any responses and even more before talking to anybody. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, but I'd like to let folks know that they may be ignored or rejected or dismissed regularly. So go into such a process with a strong disposition because it can be extremely demoralizing. I think Chris was just trying to give us, you know, something to shine a little light in there. Uh, but but yeah, uh, this, this is the norm when you're looking at applying uh, places, even if they are, you know, working on a beach. Uh, and Chris himself wrote back after yesterday's show and said, Tom is so right that this is not a great time to be a travel blogger or travel podcast for that matter. Although it's a lot worse to be a travel company, airline or cruise line. Fortunately, Chris says, I still make my living as a software engineer. My company actually just went into limited beta at bodeswell.io in the personal finance space. So if you want to help Chris out, you might go check out uh, bodeswell.io and make sure you, you keep him employed so he can keep doing amateur traveler stuff. Also got an email from Marcus who says, greetings from this week at spring in Golden, Colorado. Sounds nice, Mark. Just thought I'd mention that the first time I recall the concept of a phone screen that scrolls out to whatever size is convenient was from the Earth Final Conflict TV series from way back in 1997. It featured heavy MCI product placement, but otherwise demonstrated the practicality of this concept. Other factors took the series on a very steep decline after the first season, but somebody in the props department was top notch. Ah, thank you, Marcus. What a what a flashback. I forgot all about it with Final Conflict. That's cool. I don't even remember it to begin with, uh, but it sounds like they were onto something. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including at James P. Callison, Juan D. Hernandez, and Jonathan Price. Also, thanks to Nicole Lee. Always nice to have you. Usually it's on Fridays, it seems like. Uh, how can people keep up with everything you've been up to? Uh, well, the easiest way to do so would be uh, twitter.com slash Nicole. But of course, you can always go to Engadget.com to see my stories there. Excellent. Folks, it's been three months since we started the counter on people getting a new sticker, poster, mug, or T-shirt with the special six-year anniversary DTNS logo on it. And the first batch is headed to the factory right now. In fact, they're probably in the factory right now getting printed uh, and mailed out to 174 patrons. You can join those folks Get some cool stuff and insider perks on top of it. Get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And we're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern at 2130 UTC until Monday when it'll be 2030 UTC because oh, good point. there is daylight savings for a lot of folks. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>